Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you all. How's everybody feeling tonight? Last weekend. Can you believe this is the fifth weekend? And uh, that's kind of, I don't know, you know, at the, at the one part, it's hard work. And so you kind of like, oh, you know. But in another sense, um, so much is happening in the world around us. You just wish it would continue, that we could know more. And uh, hopefully we've at least given you enough tools to begin your own personal study, your own personal search to know what the, what the answers are, what the Bible answers are. And of course, we're here to help. But uh, let me just encourage you to keep seeking in your own search to know what God's Word says about the times that are coming upon us. Keep searching, keep seek, seeking. Our topic tonight is America in Bible prophecy. Tomorrow morning, Babylon the Great. We're actually going to be looking at Revelation chapter 17. Can I just say you do not want to miss that meeting tomorrow morning? Uh, you, you, you want to be here for that. You know, it kind of falls in a series. Tonight we're talking about U.S. and Bible prophecy, Babylon the Great tomorrow, which uh, is the apostate church. We're going to be looking at that, but in the evening we're going to be looking at the true church, and it's kind of a compare and contrast between the morning and the evening. So we'll hope you'll join us at one of our two service times, either at 8.30 or at 11.15 tomorrow. So that's Babylon the Great. But tonight we're talking about the United States. And what's interesting is most people will tell me, now come on, Pastor, are you telling me that the Bible actually says that the United States of America, which, you know, comes out of obscurity and just arises out of nowhere to be a world superpower, you know, a country really that's only a a few hundred years old, you know, a very short lifespan compared to somebody, you know, another country like England or France, are you really telling me that the United States is actually in the Bible is mentioned? Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying. Let's take a look and review some of the things that we've already studied that will help us to understand where we're going tonight. To begin, in the future, the final issue of loyalty is going to center around what? Worship. That's right. You'll see over and over again as you read through the book of Revelation that the core issue in the book of Revelation is worship. Who will we worship? As a matter of fact, it seems like the core issue in the Bible itself is the issue of worship, God's call for his people to worship him. Um, Of course, this is a letter that we read uh, in, in previous meetings pointing out involving the key issue of worship. It says, of course, the church claims that the change that was from the Sabbath to Sunday was her act and that this act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. And so we've already read and studied that this issue of the Sabbath move to Sunday is an issue of worship. And uh, this move was made by the church, and it is the mark of her power and her authority. Uh, Great book, Sunday's Coming, by Edward Reed. Feel free to look that up and and get a copy yourself. Um, But uh, the, the book says that there is evidence mounting an increasingly strong movement to legislate Sunday observance. There's good evidence in there to show that that there's an increasing movement in our society to actually force people to rest on Sunday and to, to have government enforce, a push for government to enforce a day of rest in our country. The Detroit News, Tuesday, July 7, 1998, said Pope John Paul II is issuing a stern warning to Catholics that they should set aside Sunday for worship. He went on to say a violator of Sunday should be punished as a heretic. In other words, the heat is increasing. As time moves on, we're going to see more and more that there will be pressure upon all to set aside that day, Sunday, as a day of rest. And so the great... Uh, tug and pull of history will come to a dramatic end at the end of time. Because as God's Sabbath shines out from the commandments, as God's true day of rest shines out, at the same time, there'll be a great push from the other side to worship on Sunday. And, and, And this issue of worship will come to a head in the seal of God and a mark of the beast. Now, we looked at the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 as the Roman church state power. 
We saw that this power would rule for 1,260 years from 538 AD all the way to 1798 through the period that we would call the Dark Ages in Earth's history. And that in 1798, the beast received a deadly wound when Napoleon's general marched into Rome and took the king king of the church state power, took him captive and put him in prison. When that happened, the the political power of the papacy, the political power of the Roman church state government was defeated. The church continued. People still continued to worship every Sunday. People went to mass. People still continued the blessing of of the religious uh, aspect of the church. But the church state power, the combination, the political religious power was defeated and the political power was taken away by France back in 1798. The first beast of Revelation chapter 13 we saw clearly was the Roman church state power. But when we come to Revelation chapter 13 a little later on, we find that there is another power that arises, and that is our topic for tonight. Who is the second beast of Revelation chapter 13? Why don't we take our Bibles and open there right now to the book of Revelation chapter 13, and let's begin with verse 11 and read through the passage, because of all the uh, beast powers, kingly powers, of all the political powers that arise in end-time prophecy, we're going to find that this one is a very important player, and we're going to see why in a moment. The book of Revelation, chapter 13, we're actually going to begin reading with verse 11. The book of Revelation, chapter 13, beginning with verse 11, the Bible says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of what? The earth. Now, that should shock us for a moment. For all the other beasts, they come up out of the what? The sea. This beast is different for some reason. We're going to look at that in a moment. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast. Who's the first beast? It's the Roman church state power. So this second beast has all the authority of the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That means that he takes on a prophetic power, a prophetic role at the end of time. This is not just a state power, but it's a state power that at some point will take upon itself religious interests once again. This is a passage that mocks the battle, the spiritual war over worship that happened on Mount Carmel years before when Elijah battled the prophets of Baal. It was actually God who was in the battle, but God's prophet is the one that stood tall. And the, and the battle waged over which God was real, which God would answer with fire. And of course, the story goes that, that the prayer of Elijah was answered by fire coming down out of heaven to answer his prayer, proving that Elijah's God was the true God. But at the end of time, it's the opposite. At the end of time, the Bible is telling us that the false prophet... This, this beast power at the, the end of time is actually going to be the one that's going to call fire down out of heaven and that the world is going to be deceived by these signs, which it does, because it's going to be very powerful, very mighty. It says he performs great signs, verse 13, so that even makes fire come down from heaven to the earth in the sight of men, 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So now he has the power to do something inside of the whole earth. He has the power to force the earth to make an image, and it obviously has world influence, this political beast power. Verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So like the first beast, it will also be a persecuting power. Those who do not follow, those who do not step in line with this beast power and with the first beast will be killed. Death is the penalty. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand 
or on their foreheads. This second beast is the power that will actually enforce and bring about the mark of the beast. So we're talking about a power, a political power, a beast power that holds a lot of influence, a lot of sway in the world. And obviously there's great importance set upon knowing who this beast power is. Continuing, verse 17, that no one may buy or sell except he who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So after reading that, you catch and you begin to, to grasp the importance of knowing who this beast power is. Because obviously it's the key player at the end of time. It is the power that actually enforces the, the mark of the beast. Who is it? Who is this beast? Let's look at the identifying marks that we saw and that we noticed in this passage. Let's look beginning with uh, the next, let's see, there it is. Let's find out where this power arises. Let's look at where this power arises. Well, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, that I saw another beast coming up out of the what? The earth, that's right. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, in other studies, we took specific look at this and saw that any of the beasts that came up out of the sea came up out of populated areas. Because of Revelation chapter 13, it says that in Bible prophecy, when you see sea, it's actually talking about multitudes of languages of people. This is something we've looked at several times in the past. Now we come to the book of Revelation chapter 13, and we see the opposite. This is the only beast recorded that comes up out of the earth. Well, if sea represents multitudes of peoples and tongues, and languages, what would the earth represent? It would represent an area that is sparsely populated. In other words, this beast is going to arrive, arise out of a relatively unpopulated area, a place where not a lot of people live. Comparatively, compared to, say, Europe and where all these other kingdoms arose, this kingdom arises in an unpopulated area. Continuing, not only do we want to know where this power arises, but we want to look at the governmental character of this power. The governmental character of this power. We saw in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a what? Like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now we've seen, again prophetically, that the only one who is a lamb is Jesus <laughs> in, in, in the book of Revelation. The, the lamb is Christ himself. There seems to be some connection in between this power and the Lamb. And, and what is it saying to us? It's saying that this power, this political power that arises, that arises in an unpopulated area, is going to espouse Christ-like principles. That it's founding, at its very core, there are going to be those who want this, this country, this, this kingdom that arises, it's going to want it to have in it Christ-like principles, lamb-like principles. And so we're going to see in this country, we're going to see in this power that it's going to have Christ-like principles in its, very, in its very core. Also, we saw in this passage that the first beast, this beast of Revelation chapter 13, has crowns. And crowns represent kingly authority. But on this beast's horns, there are no crowns, which represents no king. This power that's going to rise is not going to have a king over its head. It's not going to have a, a, a kingly ruler, a god ruler like most other countries have. This country is going to be different. When is this power going to arise? Does the Bible give us a timeline? Does it give us an idea of timing? In the book of Revelation 13, 12, we read, He exercises all the authority of the first beast where? In his presence. That gives us a hint. So it has to be at least around in the presence of the first beast. Let's see if we can get another hint. And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was what? healed, which means it needs to be around in the time of the actual wounding of the beast and the healing of the beast. So we should expect that we should see on a timeline that this beast is going to ar arise somewhere around the time of the wounding and the healing of the beast. The wounding of the beast happened in the year 1798 and will be present and around at the time of its healing. And uh, we we haven't really looked at that in great detail, but uh, tonight we're going to take a peek at the actual uh, healing of the beast tonight. We're going to look at some history passages on that in a moment. 
So, so at least we can see that this beast is going to arise around 1798. We should expect that it's going to rise in its presence and around the time of the wounding and the healing of the beast. It's just a hint. It's just an idea to give us or a timeline to give us to point at who this beast might be. But the Bible's at least letting us know that it is an end time superpower. Also, we want to look at how this power arises. Another hint, the Bible says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. I want you to remember something about all the beasts that are mentioned in the book of Daniel and other places. Um, think about the bear that arises, represents me to Persia. It's got three ribs in its mouth, and it's eating them. Think about the goat and the, and the, um, and the ram that meet in, in the book of Daniel chapter 8, and they slam into each other, and they crush each other, and they break each other's horns. Think about the beast of Daniel chapter 7 that has the iron teeth and the claws and crushes all the kingdoms. Every kingdom that arises is always, always arises on the defeat of another kingdom. On the back of the house, they defeat each other. The only one that doesn't, that doesn't lose by being defeated or rise by being defeated is Rome when it divides. The Bible says it just breaks into pieces. But all the other kingdoms are defeated or crushed or broken. The Bible says that this beast simply comes up out of the earth. And so we should see that this kingdom is going to grow up quietly like a plant, not through conquering other nations. This this kingdom power that grows up in an unpopulated area, it spouses Christ-like principles, it has no crown and no king, it arises around 1798 and grows up quietly, we should see that it doesn't defeat anybody to come into being, that it just kind of grows up quietly, it just kind of happens and comes to pass. Lastly, number five, we should see that this power, this, this uh, political power should have world wide influence because the bible tells us in revelation 13 12 he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed for a power at the end of time to be able to force the earth to do anything means that it must have a worldwide superpower influence it needs to have the authority the presence the military power and might to be able to influence the entire world. That really limits the powers on earth that are actually, could possibly actually do this. There's not many. Very few, as a matter of fact, could actually influence the entire world. Let's walk through our points once again. It arises in a relatively unpopulated area, espouses Christ-like principles. It has no king. It arises around the time of 1798. It grows up quietly like a plant, not through conquering, and it has worldwide power and influence. So the question then would be, who's the second beast of Revelation chapter 13? I hope that without actually having to tell you in the next slide that you've already figured out very simply that it's the United States of America. It, the, the signs couldn't possibly fit anyone else. As a matter of fact, if we look, the mystery of her coming forth from vacancy like a silent seed, we grew into an empire. This is a comment about how America came into being. Who were we? A, a group of colonies? Uh, divided, uh, you know, warring even amidst each other, uh, under the thumb of, of Britain. Um, you, know, you know, our land was divided up. We slowly gained peace parcels of land. We didn't really become a superpower till, till much later. Even, even through World War I, we were not really a superpower. It was after those times, getting closer to World War II, that we show up on the scene as, as a world superpower, as a, a world player. I mean, really, we just grew up quietly. Very interesting, these comments. We emerged amid the silence of the earth, adding daily to its strength and power. In other words, as we continued forward and grew, um, we grew strong and stronger each day, stronger each year, so that our influence is even felt around the world today. The founding fathers of the United States of America fled political and religious tyranny. They were men who were very religious and they came here to the United States of America to find freedom. Freedom to worship the way they felt God was calling them to worship. They were looking freedom of religion, freedom of worship. They didn't want the tyranny of the king of England forcing them to worship in a certain way. They did not want the tyranny of the, of the king of the Roman church state power telling them how to worship. They wanted the freedom that was found here in this great country. 
As a matter of fact, we can see in the arising of the United States that the first constitutional convention was in May 25, 1787. The Declaration of Independence around 77, 1776. We're talking about a kingdom that arrived very late on the scene. Again, compared to maybe England or France or Spain or Germany or any of these who are around for long periods of time, or even many of the Islamic countries that have, that have been around for you know, hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years, the America Americas are actually very short-lived. They're not very old at all. They're very young, arising at the end of time, just like we saw in the prophetic scenario. Notice the Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At our very core, at our very foundation, were religious principles. The men who founded this country believed in God. They trusted in God, and they wanted to found a country that would be centered in its political views in freedom and liberty and justice for all because they saw worth in all humankind. And that is a beautiful biblical concept. The United States Constitution says that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This country was founded on freedom. Friends, you and I have the freedom to worship. We can come together here on a Friday evening and we can even talk about our great country in the context of religion and world politics and have the freedom to say these things. We live in an amazing country. You can't do that everywhere in the world. You can't get up and talk about your country. You can't get up and talk about your God freely. You have to, you have to sign a covenant. You have to sign contracts with the government. And you might even die for your faith or your, your views. But here in America, we are free to speak about God, free to worship God however we please. And that is a beautiful thing. What makes this nation great? Two simple things. Number one, civil liberty. It means freedom from a king. We have no king over us. We are, we are a free people. We, the people of the United States, are actually the governing body of the United States of America. We have no one person that lords over us or rules over us or tells us what to do. We make the decisions for our country. We are the freedom of our country, and that is a beautiful thing. Secondly, our religious liberty is what makes this nation great. We are free from any pope any king, any God king who, who claims to be God, who claims to have the power of God to tell us how we should worship or what we should worship or when we should worship, we have the freedom to do as we choose as individual citizens. That is true freedom, and that is what makes our country great. People all over the world flock to this country not only because they have the hope of wealth and, uh, and, and, and being able to make a life for themselves, but they flock to this country because there is freedom in this country, freedom to worship, and freedom without a king. Every man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshiping the deity according to the dictates of his own good conscience. When religion is good, I want you to really hear this, this may be the key to everything we talk about tonight. When religion is good, it will take care of itself. But when it's not able to take care of itself, and God does not see fit to take care of it, so that it has to appeal to civil power for support, it's evidence to my mind that the cause is a bad one. I want you to really think about what George Washington, our first president, was saying to us as a country. And maybe we need to hear this a little more today. What he's saying to us as a country is this. If it's a good religion, it will take care of itself because it will be blessed by God. It won't need the state to support it. It won't need the state to pass laws to support it. It will, it will grow and thrive under God's hand. But if it's no good, then it will want the state to help it. Help it with its, uh, help it with its school system. Help it with its... Uh, mission and mission projects. It'll want the state to back it financially, back it militarily in its views. The, the church will begin to want support from the government to help it. And then George Washington says, when a church begins to look for the state to support it, it's evidence to my mind that the cause is a bad one. That was Benjamin Franklin. Sorry, that wasn't 
Uh, the, the second quote was Benjamin Franklin. The first one was George Washington. Look at Ulysses S. Grant. He says, leave the matter of religious teaching to the family altar. The church and the private school supported entirely by private contributions keep the church and state separate forever. That's interesting, isn't it? Is, uh, there's quite a bit of commotion today in the past few years about whether the state should support private Christian schools. And what is being recommended here by Ulysses Grant? It's not good. It's not good. These are our early forefathers writing on the issue of how church and state to re should relate to one another, and they recommend that they should be kept separate, and that when the church needs the state to support it, that's when the church has gone bad in the wrong direction. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, tells us that this lamb-like beast, that uh, this beast that grows up out of obscurity, this world superpower, is going to speak like a dragon. It's going to speak like a dragon. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. What does that mean? How does a nation speak? A nation speaks through its laws, through its legislative body. That's how a nation speaks. You know, a, a nation says what it's about through its laws, through its system, through its government. And through its laws and legislative body, we, found, we find out what its values are, what its value system. We've read some of those laws already. The founding core constitution of who we are is on freedom. And this country was built upon the platform of freedom. But the Bible says and predicts that there will be an erosion of freedom when the church and state unite. It predicts that in the future that this beast that has lamb-like beginnings will one day speak as a dragon, that the freedoms will erode, and one day we will actually form an image to the first beast. And what was the first beast? It was a political, religious power in the world. The deadly wound of the first beast is healing before our eyes. This is uh, from 1929, Mussolini and Gaspari signed historic Roman Pact. In 1929, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. In 1929, something really amazing happened. Italy came to the church that was not a church state anymore, the Roman church, and said to them, we want to give you your country back. We want to give you your political power back. Let's sign a pact that will give you the 200 acres of the Vatican. You can have your place and establish it once again in the world. You will once again become the papacy, a not only religious power of a church, but you will also take on your political powers once again. And in the world, you will be a church state power. Very interesting. The deadly wound is actually healing right before our eyes. Uh, this is Pope John Paul II, and he's on the cover of Time magazine. And do you know who he is? He's man of the year. He's man of the year. You know, we're, we're talking about the Pope being the head figure in politics, in news. We're talking about the Catholic Church taking the forefront in the eyes of the entire world, looking to the papacy for direction. Notice this is Keys of, his, of This Blood from Malachi Martin, um, a very interesting book. Malachi Martin is a Catholic, and he writes, Willing or not, ready or not, we are all involved in an all-out, no-holds-barred, three-way global competition. Most of us are not competitors. However, we are the stakes, for the competition is about who will establish the first one-world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations. It's about who will hold and wield the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us together as a community. And the three-way struggle that he tells us in the world, he says the three-way struggle is between capitalism, which he calls the West, he says Catholicism, which he says the papacy, and communism, the Soviet Union. This was written some time ago, by the way. Some time ago. You want to know why? One of the three players isn't really in the scene anymore, is he? As a matter of fact, at that time when Malachi Martin wrote this book, it was three players. As a matter of fact, there was a time when there were three 
uh, faces on the cover of Time magazine. Pope John Paul, Ronald Reagan, and uh, Gorbachev. And all three of pictures on the cover, and, you, and I, I think the cover went something like, who, who holds the keys to the earth, or who's, who's in control, or something like that. And then it wasn't just a few short later, few years later, that uh, one of them got deleted, and the communism in the Soviet Union no longer play that third role. Who's really at the top of the world charts when it comes to politics, power, and influence? There's only two. Today, it is capitalism, the West, which we would call the United States today, and Catholicism, the papacy. Just two. The deadly wound is healing before our eyes. Time Magazine, this is 1989, and um, on the cover here was the surprise revelation that there was a secret coalition, a secret union in between the Roman church state under John Paul II and Ronald Reagan in the United States. And the papacy in the United States combined together to defeat and combat uh, communism in Russia. They, these two combined together to make Poland an independent state, a solitary, uh, solitary movement, and hasten the demise of communism. They worked together to make communism fall, and guess what? It worked. After this, we see that there was a lot of influence in the world, so much influence so that the Pope began to make impact, political impact, in many different places, including Cuba where he went to visit with Fidel Castro and begin open up talks about freedom and peace in Cuba. Take it a step farther, uh, more recently, the Pope confronts Islam. The Pope confronts Islam. Um, those of you who were with us for Islam and Christianity last year will remember we spoke quite a bit more about this. But uh, this is the king of the north and the king of the south coming against each other. Here, right in the news in front of our eyes, we see that uh, history is moving forward and the very things that were spoken about in the Bible are coming to pass. And so the, 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 the war continues. The domination of the earth continues. Who is the great player that holds back uh, the United States and the papacy from gaining world control? It would seem like Islam is the next player that they have focused their eyes upon. Friends, the deadly wound is healing right before your eyes. This is Pope John Paul um, when he passed away. And I want you to notice that there, kneeling in front of him, I, the uh, former presidents uh, kneeling down here before him, heads of state kneeling down at the altar. Um, this is a powerful reminder of how much influence the papacy has grown through the years. This is not just a little political power. This is not just a, a, a little group of people that are, that are hiding away in some small 200-acre piece of land in Italy. No, this is a world player in politics, and his influence extends even over to the United States. The question is, how was the Roman church state formed? How was the Roman church state formed? Think about that. How did, how did the papacy form? It worked through secular governments. Think about what that means. It means back then, all those years ago, Christianity became the lead religion in Rome. And Rome embraced Christianity. And what began to happen? Christians began to dictate what the laws would be of the government. And they used secular government to enforce rules and regulations of the church. And that's how it was formed. Today, um, oh, yeah, I don't want to forget this one. Where did the Roman church state get its armies to fight its wars? It got them from England, from France, from Germany, from, from wherever they could get them. Whoever held sway religiously, in connection religiously with the papacy, gave its armies to do its bidding. That's what the Crusades were all about. The Pope said, we need to go down and take Jerusalem. We need to have the Holy Land. And so France and Germany sent its armies down to fight battles and to die and to shed their blood on land for this religious war of gaining Jerusalem, gaining the Holy Land. That's what the Crusades were all about. Its armies, to fight its wars, have always been somebody else's armies because the papacy is a religious political power that doesn't have any armies. It needs a state to combine with to be able to enforce itself. So what's happening in our world today? Are we forming an image to the beast in the United States? 
I want you to take a look at the news and just listen to Christian radio. More and more and more, we as Protestant Christians are becoming political. More and more and more, we are trying to hit the scene. This is, of course, uh, Ralph Reed. He was uh, head of the Christian Coalition, and uh, he was a power force in politics uh, with their goal of taking over United States government politics. And that was what they wanted to do. These are good Christian folk who want to make a change, but they're doing it the wrong way, friends. They're trying to change the government by taking over the government and legislating religiosity. But friends, we are not called to do that. The way that God transforms governments is through the preaching of the gospel. Did Jesus try to change Roman law so that it would reflect Christian values? No, he came preaching Jesus Christ, preaching the values of Jesus. Uh, Jesus came preaching the values of God, the love of God, the peace of God. And in that proclamation, in that sharing that love, he transformed the world. He transformed governments, not by trying to change governments, but by trying to change the hearts of the people through the good news. James Dobson, you know, there was a time when we used to listen to Focus on Family all the time. You know, how many people have ever listened to Focus on the Family, right? Absolutely. Great value set up. But then we started to see something over time. Instead of getting on and listening to about how to be a better mom or how to be a better dad, all of a sudden we started hearing about this bill is passing and you need to call in and you need to vote against this. And then it was, we need to have a, we need to rally and, well, you know, we need to, we need to vote for this person and or we need to vote for this person. And all of a sudden we found that instead of talking about family values, we were talking about politics. And radio started to move uh, to in that direction. Chuck Colson and others focusing on politics. Notice this quote, May, June, 1980. If Christians unite, we can do anything We can pass any law or any amendment, and that's exactly what we intend to do. I want you to see that this is the goal for Christians to take over the government so that we can enforce our views and our opinions and our laws. This sweeping declaration, evangelicals, including Pat Robinson and Charles Colson, joined with conservative Roman Catholic leaders Tuesday in upholding the ties of faith that bind the nation's largest and most politically active religious groups. Do you remember the quote I just read before? If Christians would unite, then they could make the government do whatever they wanted. Well, guess what this is saying? Protestants, Pat Robertson, Chuck Colson, joining together with Roman Catholics, the two biggest political movers in the United States religiously, are now joining together, coming together, Protestants and Catholics, for what purpose? To do what we read on our last slide, to force the government to legislate religion. In the last generation, it has become common for evangelicals and Catholics to work together on issues such as pornography, vouchers, or religious education, and voluntary prayer. What's different in the statement is the efforts to turn the theological swords honed over centuries of conflict into a recognition of the common faith. So instead of fighting against each other through swords of theology, they've stopped that and they've come together. Catholics and Protestants no longer fighting against each other. They've embraced one another, and Christianity is now uniting under one banner and one purpose. And what is that, you say? What are they wanting to do? What are they wanting to join together to do? They're joining together so that they can influence American politics, so that they can legislate religion. The wayward daughters are returning to the mother church. Lutherans and Methodists have essentially abandoned the Reformation, and they've united with the Catholic Church. John Cardinal O'Connor says, this book is a giant step towards understanding not only our differences, but how common is our goal and how much we share theologically. It's time that we're caught up with the quiet conservative revolution that began a number of years ago in evangelical Catholic relations and helped to advance it. John Cardinal O'Connor is saying this very simply. Look! It's happening. We're coming together. And, and this cardinal of the Catholic Church is saying, we really don't have much religious difference. Really? We've been studying for about five weeks now of what the Bible teaches and what the truth is. And I'm not sure that any of that, those views have changed recently. If I'm, if I'm wrong, I, if there's a new book that's come out on, on theology from the, from the Roman Church state, I would love to see that. But the truth is, is that their theology hasn't changed. So what's happened? 
So, so why is it that we're saying that we really don't have anything to separate us? That are that are theologically we're coming together that we don't see any differences. Lutherans and Catholics unite to heal 482 year old division. This is in 1999. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based upon bad history. This is William Reinquist. I want you to notice that it's moving from the realm of just churches coming together for the purpose of legislating religion. And it's moving into the very area where now we have chief justices in our Supreme Court who hold these values. The ones who are making final decisions on constitutional law. We're finding that even our even our justices now are writing and talking about the fact that church and state, that whole idea that our forefathers put in place so that freedom might be in our country, is what? It's just based upon bad history. That's what William Rehnquist says, who's the chief, one of the chief justices. St. Louis Post-Dispatch says, As the secondary century of the Bill of Rights draws to a close, the Supreme Court is redefining what religious liberty will mean in the third century. Broadly, the court's new approach helps conventional religions while hurting what? Unconventional ones. This is what's happening. Let me be frank and clear with you. What's happening is this, is that the big churches are all coming together, and they're deciding on the things that they have in common, and then now they're moving in the government so that that legislation can be passed and the whole United States of America can be forced to follow big religion. Big government and big religion joining together doesn't bode well for those who have differing religious views. What that does is it eats away at our freedom, our freedom to be able to worship, our freedom to be able to choose on what day we worship. As a matter of fact, this is prophecy being fulfilled. We've already talked about the seal of God being the Sabbath, God's day, written in the commandments. We've already looked at Sunday being the mark of the beast in Scripture. And here we are seeing that within our own country, these things are coming to a head. As a matter of fact, it wasn't that long ago I was listening to Focus on the Family, and James Dobson was making a big push saying that our government needs to legislate a day for the family, a day of rest, a day where no one would work, that all stores should be closed, or offices should be closed, that all factories should be closed. Everybody should be mandatory rest for a 24-hour period. And guess which day he feels should be closed down, no work, no malls, no nothing. Guess what day he thinks should be closed? Sunday. That's right. Under the auspice of a day for the family. And how can you argue with that, right? How could you stand up and say that's a bad thing? You know, we do need a day off. But we should be able to choose the day off that we want, friends. And God's day off, according to the Bible, is the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. The Bible's telling us that church and state will unite, and they will unite to enforce religious practices. You say, when are these final events going to come to pass? When can we expect these things to come to a head? You know, how is this going to happen? It doesn't seem like it's really reached that peak point yet. I believe a spiritual decline, natural disasters, social chaos, and economic difficulties will lead up to the church-state union. I believe we're going to see more of these things happen, just as Jesus said. And as they happen in a more intense way, more and more voices are going to rise up and say, all of these things happening, economic collapse, spiritual decline, natural disasters, are happening because we've fallen away from God. We need to go back to God. We need to, we need to worship God as a country. We need to go back to our roots. We need to be Christian again. We need to go back to worship. And more and more, that voice will cry out as things get worse. And then, and then it will be enforced by law that no offices will be open, everything will be closed, and it will continue to press forward. People have to go to church. We need to return to God, return to God, return to God. And that's what we're going to hear. Are things getting bad? What's going to initiate the final events of Bible prophecy? Have things reached the point where we've begun to erode our freedoms? Have we begun to lose the freedoms that we've so enjoyed in the past? And have we given them up willingly? Have we begun to lose our freedoms, friends? Yes, and have we given them up willingly? Yes, it's a war on terror. Nobody wants bombs or planes running into buildings, right? We want to be, we don't, we want to be safe, and we're willing to give up some of our freedoms so that we'll be safe. Well, how many of your freedoms are you willing to give up? Friends, in the end, um, certain powers in this world will seek to take away all of our freedoms. Has the Roman church state power find it, found its end-time armies? 
Has it found the military power that will do its bidding? It's already done its bidding once. It's already done its bidding once. Communism clacks because of it. Now their eyes are on Islam. Have we, have we come to the place where the Roman church state power has found its military backing once again? Has it found a friend and ally that believes like it does and will help it to accomplish its purpose to bring Christianity by blessing or by force to the entire world? Friends, Rome versus Christ. Who will you choose? Rome or Christ? We all have a choice to make. We all will one day need to stand up and choose whether we will follow God or we will follow the apostate church. In the days of Noah, God invited his people to take a stand. He invited them, come into the ark, choose this day to believe what the word of God says and to come into his ark of safety. In the days of Daniel, God invited his people to take a stand while everyone else was bowing down. Three young men made the decision to stand for God faithfully. And their words ring out to us through the ages as they said, King, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your statue. Friends, will we stand in the day of God's visitation? Even in the days of Jesus, friends, God invited his people to take a stand. As Jesus hung on the cross, salvation went out to all. And friends, there were many that were hiding that day. But as the gospel went forward, they took a stand for Jesus, even if it meant their lives would be cost. Even in the days of our early church history, over 120 million people through the dark ages were martyred for their faith, but they stood for their convictions. They stood for the word of God. They stood for their freedom of worship. They stood for their right to be able to worship God and to stand with him. In the dark ages, God invited his people to take a stand. Martin Luther stood before the great princes of the earth, the king of Germany. He stood there with his Bible, a humble monk, and preached the word faithfully. In the last days, God invites his people to take a stand. Will you stand on the side of God? Friends, it's my prayer that as you're hearing these meetings and as things come to pass and you will see them before your eyes, that you will take the stand on the right side, that you will choose to stand on God's side, choose to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ is my prayer.